you mentioned before that you have this this two-year trial that you just published recently on postmenopausal women looking at creatine supplementation and different properties of of bone um, health bone strength does creatine supplementation make our bones stronger uh they can <laughs> so a little bit of the background it, it was kind of by accident when you do a dexa scan you can get some lean tissue and of course then you can get some measures of bone mineral and there was a cellular study done early 2000s which showed these osteoblast cells which are the cells involved in bone formation they became really energized in the presence of creatine so theory was maybe our bone is responsive to supplementation as, as well and then based on the the law of muscle bone interaction if you have more muscle it's going to pull on your bone throughout the day when you're performing activities of daily living or weightlifting, and maybe that could stimulate bone growth uh, and then the question is, well, which population would probably benefit from having greater bones? And of course, it's primarily um, postmenopausal females. And so we've done a couple studies now. And in the first study, it was a low sample size. It only had slightly over 30 postmenopausal females. We gave 0.1 gram per kilogram of creatine for a whole year of resistance training. And the reason for that bone takes a long time to turn over, um, at least about six months before you're looking at bone mineral density. Um, and we showed that creatine reduced the rate of bone mineral loss in the hip region compared to placebo. So they didn't increase, but again, the relative deficit was the people that just perform uh, resistance training uh, had a significant in or decrease in bone mineral density, whereas the creatine group was more preserved. And then we thought, okay, that has some lines of evidence to now do a larger study. And as you just alluded to, uh, it took about a decade to finally get from start to finish. <laughs> Uh, we had 200 post or over 200 postmenopausal uh, females randomized. So, the issue with nutritional research, any researcher will tell you, we're always limited with very small sample sizes. So that increases a lot of variability. But this was one of the rare creatine studies to have over 80% power. Um, and we then decided that let's do two years uh, of uh, resistance training. And this was machine-based, supervised three days a week. But we also wanted to add in six days of walking to achieve to the recommended guidelines of 150 minutes uh, per week. Um, and then we even did a higher dose, 0.15 gram. So let's summarize. They were taking about 11 grams a day, three times as much as what we typically recommend for young individuals from a muscle perspective. They did two years of exercise. And the results were kind of encouraging, but a little surprising. So you would think at that high dose, with two years of exercise, everything would have went up. Um, actually, the only thing we shot, saw improvements was that it improved bone uh, geometry. So it increased bone strength, and it sort of improved the strength of the bone primarily around the hip region, which we think is really important because that's an area uh, of clinical uh, displacement if you suffer a hip fracture. We also showed that it improved lean tissue and gait speed compared to placebo. So there was some advantageous effects. The counter argument is what if we had a group who did no exercise? I speculate that it would be catastrophic. Uh, two years you know, of exercise maintained some areas, improved strength a little bit. But if we had a group who did nothing, which is most of the world's population, that might have really catastrophic effects. So exercise needs to be there and creatine may give some slightly greater beneficial effects. We've also shown some muscle and bone benefits in males as well. So it's not just a cessation of estrogen. We think those things can have some favorable effects. Okay, I have a bunch of questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, about that. So in that study, so there was no there was no control group that, that didn't do resistance training. The control Correct. group was resistance training plus six minutes of walking. Yes, yeah, six days of walking, correct. Six days of walking, sorry, but with a placebo versus- Yeah, and both groups got calcium and vitamin D on a daily basis to offset any of the mm. bone-related issues, yeah. Did bone mineral density improve, stay the same, or go I know there's no between group differences, but did, did both groups experience an improvement or a reduction in bone mineral density um, with the, the resistance training in place that they had? Yeah, there was no overall uh, change, actually a slight reduction. Um, but again, bone mineral is so subjective to that. But again, even with creatine. So we now conclude that creatine does not increase bone mineral density. It may preserve the skeleton or make it a bit stronger. 
um, but sort of the architecture, because we measured trabecular and cortical bone before, um, but measuring by DEXA or the aerial shell, um, we're not seeing any increase in bone mineral. It may help preserve the skeleton um, more than placebo. Is that type of result with bone mineral density with a resistance training program in place consistent with the overall body of, of literature? looking at this? Yeah, unfortunately, um, our skeleton is super stubborn. <laughs> and when you look at even studies that just look at weight training, you get a small increase in bone accrual. It may only be as little as one to 3% over years. So we don't really see a, a huge increase in bone mineral density with the technology that we're using. There's always standard error there. Um, not nearly as much as you get an increase in muscle mass. And in terms of that that training program, I, I know from looking at some uh, of the studies that have attempted to improve bone mineral density with different types of training interventions, that uh, resistance training is important, but also kind of weight-bearing um, impact type exercise like hopping or skipping or jogging where the ground reaction force is greater than you would be subjected to on a daily basis also seems to be another stimulus that's important. Um, was that part of this? Was this like a multimodal kind of exercise intervention or was it pure resistance training? Yeah, that's an excellent point. It was actually just pure machine based. Um, so there was no multi, there was multi joint exercises, but there was no plyometrics or box jumps and things like that. And the walking was subjective. They just walked at as briskly at their own pace. But that's an excellent point. We now know bone will respond very well to variety strains and vectors. Um, complex training methods come into play, but to the population, it's very difficult. We're taking some special populations with maybe some mobility issues there. Uh, what could happen, that's a really good idea to do this maybe in young trained females or young physically active females, especially um, who may be more prone or able to do that type of training and maybe have some bone beneficial effects. And then we could extrapolate that to an older population. So that's a very good idea. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. You mentioned that there were some changes to bone architecture, and I think you, you said bone geometry. Just to double click on this, what is the difference between bone mineral density, which people will probably have heard of quite a lot and many people have gone out and done a DEXA scan, what's the difference between that and bone geometry? Yeah, there's a huge difference. So if your viewers have had a DEXA or a body composition scan at the hospital, um, basically it's only measuring the aerial or the, the cylinder, if you will, of the bone. And so when we measure bone mineral density, or content, it's just simply measuring the weight of the bone. Um, uh, interestingly, with uh, QCT or high resolution PQCT, you can actually now separate what's inside the bone from cortical and trabecular. And we've shown actually using PQCT, that bone area primarily below the knee, uh, did improve in males and females on creatine. So it was actually having some additional lines of evidence that the geometry or architecture sort of under or in the bone uh, was improving, not just the shell of the bone. So it's a little bit more scientific. And so in this two year um, trial with postmenopausal women, there were some changes to bone geometry that are suggestive that that bone may be able to withstand more force. Yes. That's an excellent interpretation because we did only use DEXA, but then we use software around the hip region to predict. Uh, our previous study for one year, um, we did see improvements using PQCT, but a huge limitation of this two-year study is we only use DEXA. And so is there any interest in, in following these subjects for longer or seeing how the changes in bone geometry may translate to differences in, in fracture incidents? Yeah, that's an excellent point. If we get funding, I would love to call back on these individuals in five or 10 years, especially. And that's kind of when you would see the, the, the effectiveness. And then you piggyback that off saying, well, what about now we do studies in young females? Maybe we can get the bone really large or strong when they're 18, 19 years of age. And maybe that'll offset the rate of bone mineral loss as we get older. Um, so the theory or the myth that is 
it's kind of never too early to work out young males and females should be exercising and hopefully we can build up the body that will offset the catastrophic effects of, of sort of biological process of aging but there's a whole bunch of areas we have several studies planned um and we're also thinking now what if we do the old old age like could creatine and exercise have potential beneficial effects for 80 and above and, and we think it might the timing of the intervention is super interesting i remember reading a review on uh, bone mineral density and, and postmenopausal women and it spoke about the fact that there seems to be quite a rapid loss of bone in the the first handful of years after menopause so if if the average age of menopause i think is about 51 or between 47 and, and 51 and if i recall correctly you know, the average woman could lose five to seven and a half percent of their bone mineral density in that that first five year period. So I wonder, you know, whether the effect of creatine and the benefit could be dictated by when you intervene. So mm. if you if you intervene when a woman is fifty one versus intervening when she's sixty. Mm -hmm. and already experienced that that rapid bone loss, would there be a difference in terms of outcome? Yeah, that's exactly our line of thinking to look at premenopausal versus perimenopausal. And then we're in, it's very interesting. We wait at 20, or our participants had to wait 24 months from the cessation of the last menstrual cycle. So they were sort of well into the menopausal years. Uh, but you're right, what if we got it during the menopausal transition into early menopause and late menopause? So that's an area where we'd have to do a series of studies with large sample sizes to sort of look at that. My guess is you would have to sort of piece together a number of studies to come up with some foundational evidence, yeah. So there was no difference in the, the bone mineral density between the placebo and the, and the creatine group in the two-year study. But from your earlier pilot study, there was significant differences in, in bone mineral density, I think femoral neck from, from memory. Why, why do you think that those, the two studies had different results? Well, it's counterintuitive to what we think because you would do long weight training and a higher dose. So we don't think any of those things played a role. The big issue we think is statistical power. Whereas the later lattice or the, the later study, we had over 200 individuals. In the first study, we only had over 30. So the chance could have been by finding. It was significant. The effect size was, was low to moderate, um, but it could be by chance of the people that were randomized in that. And that's kind of what we speculated. And the, the changes in in architecture from a mechanistic point of view you mentioned before that it has been thought that you know creatine can increase muscle mass and strength and that can can then result on on more force being put through the skeleton you can you can you can lift a, a greater load is that the primary mechanism by which creatine is influencing bone architecture or does creatine itself play a role in bone tissue and affect osteoblasts and, and osteoclasts, these cells that are building and breaking down bone? It's a great uh, uh, analogy. We think it has a direct and indirect uh, effect. So let's go with the one you just mentioned, the indirect. So the theory is if creatine and resistance training increases muscle mass, uh, muscle will pull on the bone and maybe that's some of the stimulating effects. So that's an indirect way. But there's actually some good cellular uh, uh, data to, to suggest it actually has direct effects. So uh, as I alluded to, that study in the early 2000s simply showed that osteoblast cells in the presence of creatine sort of increase their activity. And so the theory would be if that osteoblast cells have more activity in the presence of calcium, maybe they can sort of piece together more skeleton or more calcium into your bone. But we've actually shown now numerous times Creatine has been shown to uh, decrease markers of bone breakdown. So these things called NTL peptides or markers of collagen breakdown. So creatine has been shown now in a, several studies in young and older adults to reduce a uh, collagen breakdown. So you could say, okay, we might have some benefits with osteoblasts. Now we might actually preserve um, bone breakdown. It's kind of like a bisphosphonate, not nearly at the same level, but that's the theory. So when you get the uh, balance, maybe the bone could have a greater integrity over time. So even though the 
the kind of, I guess the results with regards to bone health are, are not clear cut at the moment. There's, there's some signal. We don't have long term studies that look at the hard outcomes like fractures themselves. But I'm, I'm assuming that your position, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that because of the benefits for lean mass, um, potentially motor coordination and the safety profile that you, you spoke to, that creatine would still be worth supplementing to try and reduce our risk of fractures as we age, even if the effects on bone strength are somewhat debatable at this point. Yeah, I think it's something to consider on top of the resistance training cake because, as you just said, we've it has been shown to do this in, in some studies. The other big thing is our colleagues in Brazil have not shown any bone effects without exercise. So this is important. If you're taking creatine and you're expecting to get these magical powers, it's not going to happen. You need to do some form of exercise. And the dose seems to be higher. Uh, they looked at one in three grams a day for up to two years and they found no effects. Uh, the dose we've given and other labs have given is, is higher. Um, so it seems to be a little bit higher with exercise and you may be able to get some greater effects. And if that decreases the risk of falls or improves ability or, uh, uh, you know, more importantly, decreases fractures, uh, that's something to at least consider. 